They, uh, <clears throat> now let's go back here. I, I apologize. I have to start all over again. We're going to go two hours tonight instead of one. Uh, <laughs> hope you forgive me. Anyway, we have the ancient walled in house up here. We have the animals down below. We have the heat going up from the animals. All right, now we talked about the pastors being doctors, many of them. Okay, they were the doctors group. They were the studiers. If they had, you know, some of these people didn't have much Bible. But these people have been known also as the Paulicians before, haven't they? These are the same people that were Paulicians. All right, they came into Europe. Some of them had Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And some of them only had pieces of it. And the Paulicians, of course, had what? The writings of the, the Apostle Paul, okay? They had Paul's writings. And uh, they had to live like this, of necessity. They had to live away from everybody. They dressed different. They talked different. They talked. If you met one of them in town, you would know them just by their speech because they spoke a different dialect than everybody. Just think about it. They spoke a different type of dialect than everyone else. You could tell them. When the Waldenses were discovered, they had been hiding back here for over a thousand years in these mountains. They wore their own kind and style of clothes. Now, we know that the, the Mennonites, the Mennonites wear a certain style of clothes. They got this style of clothing and their lifestyles from these people. They were converts by Anabaptists from... Menno Simmons was a convert of, out of the Catholic Church. All right? They converted a lot of people. But there was something else also. The people that they converted usually came in contact with them. They wouldn't go out contacting them. They tried to stay to themselves so they could stay alive. Now... Not all of these people were totally doctrinally sound on every area. I want you to understand that. We would like to think, especially Baptists, some Baptists, would like to be able to trace their lineage all the way back, straight, unbroken, all the way to Christ. I guarantee you you can do it by theology and by practice and faith. Because we know that the Lord said He... In Matthew 16 and 18, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, they ask the first chapter of Ephesians. It all tells us the Lord's churches would be here until they came back. And that system of teaching would be here all the way till the end of this age. We know that. Do you believe that? Absolutely. I believe it. I don't have to have it down on paper that this happened. So many people today foo foo the trail of blood. And all the while well, when they say, oh, we, I wouldn't want to be related to some of those people. I'm going to tell you something. They wouldn't, be one, they, wouldn't be one, they wouldn't want to be related to them either. Now, all these people <clears throat> were not doctrinally sound in every area all the time. But I'll tell you some things that they believed. We talked about the 11 essential elements from the New Testament church. Didn't we? What were some of those things that were very important to them that ought to be important to us today? What? Number one, polity. Church government. What was it? Congregational rule. All right? Congregational rule. In some of these places, you'll find out that a pastor had a little more to say than they did in some places. All right? But most of them were congregational rule. All right? They were, well, not most of them, they were congregational rule. But just different levels of it. Okay? What's another thing? What do they teach about baptism? Right. This is really important. They have to have the right baptism. Have the right baptism. And every one of these churches believed that there had to be a lineage of baptism from Christ. You had to trace your lineage back. And that's why they call them Anabaptists. They wouldn't accept anybody else's baptism. You go to a, what we call an Orthodox Baptist church today. Primitive Baptist, Missionary Baptist, Old Southern Baptist, uh, landmark missionary Baptists, all these churches, these churches would not accept anybody's baptism. They wouldn't accept other Baptists' baptism. If you can't trace your baptism back to those churches, they say you really need to be baptized again. We won't accept you on your baptism that you have. Number one, it may be good. Okay. If it's good, that's good. 
But if it isn't good, what have we done? We've allowed baptism, bad baptism, invalid baptism to get into our church. So to protect our church and the lineage of our church, we will baptize you again when you come into our group. I was baptized a long time ago. When I started working with a group up in Nevada, uh, and I was a assistant pastor up there, and kind of a co-pastor, I guess you'd call it. I preached as much as he did, sometimes more. And I did almost all the teaching. They asked me when I was going to join the church, where church are you from? What did they believe? Well, I told them what they believed. They said, well, that's really good, but we need to find out from the church what they believed. I said, well, the church doesn't exist. It's not the existence of it. Okay. We won't accept your baptism. You have to be baptized by us. If you come over here, you're going to have to be baptized by us. Do you have any objections to being baptized to make sure that your baptism is good in our church? Your baptism is probably good, but we don't know that. So to protect the valid validity of our baptism, would you be baptized as, and come in as by baptism in this church? I said, that's fine with me. That's good, as a matter of fact. That's Baptist. That's the way Baptists have, have been for many, many years. You go out in the, in the far away reaches of these people. If you go to any primitive Baptist, you'll find out that they have some odd ways some of them do. And we would like, of course we're jumping ahead just a little bit, we would like for every church all the way through history to be able to trace itself doctrinally in every point that we believe today, don't we? Polity, church rule, is very important to those. Baptism is extremely important to all of them. The Lord's Supper was a church, local church ordinance. They say, if you're a member of this church, you take the Lord's Supper with us. That's, that's who takes the Lord's Supper. Everybody else, you're a member of some other church. If we can't practice discipline on you, you can't take the Lord's Supper with us because that's one of the, the prerequisites to the Lord's Supper is what? Church discipline. Are you in harmony with the, with the group. Do you believe what they do? Whatever, you know. This is part of it. So that was one of the things that they did. And basically, that's about it. They believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Some of them, <clears throat> after Calvin came on the scene, and sometimes even before Calvin came on the scene, some of them were a little bit hyper-Calvinistic. Now, especially particular Baptists. We're going to get into that later. All right? Some of them were a little bit hyper-Calvinistic in their beliefs. We're jumping ahead a little bit. But why do you think almost every Southern Baptist church originally was called an Orthodox, landmark, missionary Baptist church? To distinguish between the different theologies. That's right. Some of them were called Unity Baptist Church. Some of them were called Separate. Some of them were called General Baptist. Now, we're jumping ahead a little bit, but I just want you to understand some where we are right now. Understand some. Some of these people didn't believe on every point of doctrine like we believe. All right. Almost all these churches did not believe that their church gifts were in existence anymore. What do I mean by that? They weren't charismatic. Today we've got a lot of charismatic churches out there, don't we? Talking in tongues and laying on the hands and healing and all this kind of stuff. Now, God can heal people today, but the gift of healing is not with us. At one time in the church, if a person had the gift of healing, you could go and heal people. You could raise people from the dead. There weren't any limits to it. The gift of healing, there were no limits to it. It has nothing to do with the faith of the person being healed at all either, by the way. It was strictly by the power of God. But when the Bible was completed, that ceased. Those gifts ceased. The gift of, the gift of languages, which is talking in tongues, as they talk about it today, it's not even really the same thing at all. Now, it really depended on churches how doctrinally sound they were is how much of the Bible they had.
If these people were scattered out out here in Timbuktu someplace and they only had five pages of the New Testament, how doctrinally sound do you think they might be? Historically, now, they were founded by some other church and they had some basic rules of belief. The ones I gave you, they believed. Okay? But how much? How would you like to live, Brother Mike, without the Bible? How would you like to live without the Bible? They probably didn't have much of it. If they had the Bible at all, it came out of their pastor's mouth. Maybe some deacons that get up and quote some of the Bible to them. Maybe they had copied it down on Scripture. And you know what? We, You'd really be dependent on the Spirit of God to move your heart. Yes. Do you see how they had some basic tenets that they adhered to? These are the ones. Baptism. Baptism by only by a New Testament church and baptism of only adults that believe. And I, don't, I mean an adult, I mean even Dakota. Anybody that came to the point that they knew that they were saved and asked God to forgive them, then they could be baptized. But you couldn't believe, you, could, you couldn't be baptized until you made a profession of faith. And they had catechisms. What's catechism? We think catechism, we think Catholic Church. Baptists had catechisms before the Catholic Church ever had. Baptists had Sunday schools before anybody ever had. What was a catechism? What was it? Brother, Brother David, when you were young, when you were saved, and you were part of a Mennonite church, weren't you? Before you could be baptized, what did you have to do? I had to get up and give a public profession of faith. Uh, tell them what you believe and, and why you and believe why it. Believe it. Yeah. That's correct. Well, Baptists, the Anabaptists were even more than that. All of the tenets of the adherents of God's churches, a child, if it was eight, nine years old, had to get up and recite before the whole congregation. Now, the whole congregation might be 30 people. And basically, there were fam their family and the people that they had grown up with all their lives anyway. I so it's no big, there's Uncle Joe over here and Uncle Pete over there and Mom and Dad here and Grandma and Grandpa over there and whatever. I had to give scriptural reference yep. to the things that I said as well. It wasn't just, I'm saved by grace and yep. that, that I accept Jesus as my Savior. I had to have scriptural reference before the church of why that was. That's good. That's good. Of course, my folks helped me with it. Yeah. They had the catechism. They had the catech you had to go to their catechism, didn't you? You had to be taught. Well, that's very important. Dakota, I taught her a lot at home when she was young. I mean, she knew more than my students, a lot of them. I could ask a little thing. She could sit back there and write Greek and everything else when I was teaching my Greek classes and everything. This was little. Before she could even read and write English, she was reading and writing Greek. Or not reading it so much, but writing it. She would take it off the board and put it down on a piece of paper. And she's a good artist. She could do it just like I did. Teach your children in the way that should go. And they would get up and they would make professions of faith and they would tell why they wanted to become a church member. And they would get up and say what their responsibilities of church member were. This is very important. These were the early Baptists. Okay, these are those people that lived back at those times. I'm going to read something to you. <clears throat> This boy was 11 years old. This was a uh, when he died. And I took part in the funeral. Some of his family were Baptists and some of them were Catholics. But this is the thing that they put in the, in the fly out, the flyer, the handout. <clears throat> I'm going to read this to you. Now I'm going to see if you see something wrong with it. Okay. O gentlest heart of Jesus, ever present in the blessed sacrament, ever consumed with burning love for the poor captive souls in purgatory, have mercy on this soul of thy departed servant. servant. Be not severe in thy judgment, but let some drops of thy precious blood fall upon the devouring flames. And do thou, O merciful Savior, send the angels to conduct 
thy departed servant to a place of refreshment, light, and peace. Amen. May the souls of all faithful departed to the mercy of God rest in peace. I'm going to tell you something. During this period of time, that's what the Catholic Church believes. Now, we haven't come to the we haven't come to the Protestant Reformation yet. It's coming along. Wycliffe has wandered on the scene in 1330 to 1384, a great preacher. The Catholic Church has started the, the uh, ungodly, hellish doctrine of celibacy, transubstantiation. They've uh, married the church and the state. They've started infant baptism. They have endorsed the doctrine of Mariolatry. That's the worship of Mary. Of Mary. They have invented purgatory. They have invented indulgences. They have invented saint and image worship. This has all come about in the religious world now. Okay, And Baptists are standing off over here acting like little weirdos, different than everybody else, believing the things that I've told you about, some of the basic doctrines, tenets of the faith. And they're totally separate and totally different. Finally, in different places, it became more tolerable for them to live. Jumping ahead again. When the Puritans came to America on the Mayflower, the pilgrims, pilgrims, you mean the wanderers, you know, when they came over here, now the Catholic Church had already hit the West Coast, hadn't they? What had the Catholic Church done on the West Coast? Established mission and killed everybody in opposition. If you wouldn't be a Catholic, I mean, whole nations were destroyed by the Catholic Church on the West Coast. Whole, I'm talking all the way from Mexico all the way to San Francisco and Oregon and Washington and everything. Every place that they hit, they killed and murdered. And they took captive. And they built missions which were nothing but slave plantations. That's all they were. And if you weren't a convert, you were dead. That's the way the Catholic Church existed in Europe, so that's the way that we're going to exist right here. On the East Coast, when they came over here, on the East Coast, and the states, the first states they founded on the East Coast was founded, the East Coast was founded by what? English. English. And French, somewhat. Mostly English, a few Germans around. Germans and Russians basically came over here on the West Coast of San Francisco, Washington, up and through there. How did they treat the natives on the East Coast? They tried to make kings out of them. They tried to get somebody to answer for everybody else, which Indians were a democracy. They didn't know what in the world they were talking about, having somebody sign a paper uh, as a king. And you hear the word, the Indian princess. Ever heard of Indian princess? My grandfather grandmother was an Indian princess or whatever. Hogwash. No such thing. Not among Indians. White people... That the Europeans tried to say this is an Indian princess here because her father was an Indian prince, a king, a chief. There were no real chiefs among Indian people like the white people would think. You were a leader only as long as you were a leader. That's all. And usually just for a short period of time. If it was a long period of time, that was unusual because that was an exceptional person. Nobody could sign for anybody. If you wanted to sign a tribe up, no chief could sign for any tribe. Period. Because these people were democracies. United States today, if it went by Indian democracy, when they made a treaty with any country, everybody in the United States would have to sign the treaty. There wouldn't be anybody going to sign that treaty for them. We elect presidents and senators and representatives and congressmen and all that kind of stuff, but they didn't do that. They... You signed, if, if, if any Indian tribe did it, nobody had to agree with anybody else. This was a democracy, a real democracy. And that's the way Baptist churches were too, by the way. True democracies. Well, when America was founded over here, the Puritans came over here to America for why? Why did they come here? Religious freedom. 
Religious freedom. For whom? From the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. From the Church no. of England. No. Church of England. They wanted to reform the Church of England. Why did they come here? What were they going to do here? What were they going to do here? They were going to establish a state church here run by them so they could do exactly... They didn't understand anything else except state churches. Because this is the whole history of Catholicism and the Church of England is state churches, isn't it? They were going to stand in state churches. You, you could not differ from them whatsoever. The two first colonies that allowed any religious freedom at all was Virginia a little bit later, after a few Baptists were whipped and beaten and killed and dumped to death. The Puritans didn't give Baptists any room at all. They killed every one of them or baptized them to death or dumped them to death, put them in stocks, whipped them, burned them as witches. Pennsylvania, there was a little bit of religious freedom there. But uh, Rhode Island was the first place established with real religious freedom freedom, and it was established by John Clark in 1638. That church was started, and he petitioned the king of England to allow them an experiment of religious freedom. This is 1638. There was nothing before that. Only state churches. Or in Europe now. What do you think that there is in Europe? Every, every nation has a church state. So where are the Baptists? Was a, in history, was a Baptist part of any church state anywhere? Was there a Baptist church state? No. No. So what were they? If you were an Anabaptist, you were an outcast. You were a real pilgrim. You know what a pilgrim is? Traveler. They traveled to the world, but they weren't part of it. They had to live. They had to look different. And they had to live away from everybody so they could exist. Talk about paranoid, Brother Mike. They needed to be paranoid to stay alive. If you saw somebody coming dressed different than you do, dressed, talking with a different dialect, you better haul on out of there in a real fast hurry. You know why? Because it was very probable that they lived in a church state wherever they lived unless they lived out in an isolated point. And if you live in a church state, if you're anything but what that church state is, you are what? You are a criminal. Because you're defying the state. Boy, that's rough, isn't it? All these people weren't totally tied up absolutely doctrinally sound straight down the line at everything that we think is doctrinally sound today. Why, uh, Baptists today, we have conventions that we put out a doctrinal statement of the convention, of the associations meetings. They have a doctrinal statement of association meetings. We have doctrinal statements of churches. We adhere to this and this and this, etc. That's good. What was so wrong in 325 A.D. at the Council of Nicaea? What was wrong about that? What did they do there? First of all, they established a state church. The church and the state became one. They uh, canonized scriptures. They tried to figure out which scriptures were true and which weren't. They were working on that. They decided uh, about the identity of God, who God was, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. By the way, baptism was by immersion. They weren't far off on that. But what was the real problem? They tried to unify what truth was. But when they unified what they said truth was, there was something wrong with the polity of the churches at that time, Brother David. What was wrong? The polity of those churches. It was not it was congregational. It was no longer congregational rule. Congregation had no power over the system at all, did they? It was ruled 
by the hierarchy. Yeah. That's right. So was that wrong? What did that do to the church? If you wanted to get down today, as we doctrinally look at the church to see if a church, what we say we think a church would be doctrinally sound, whether we accept their baptism, could you accept any of their baptism? No. What? Because their polity was messed up. Right. Is that important? Yes. Yes, it's very, very important. All right. So that was wrong. <clears throat> now we have established what they say truth is, and a lot of it was truth. But the identity of the church was all perverted. It was perverted. Because the church was no longer congregational rule. But it was ruled by a hierarchy. This, there were some real good things. You know, one of my students here a while back, and when we'd gone through the discipleship program, he made it kind of a joke. And he said, well, I learned one thing. Judas liked money, and so did the pastors. <laughs> That was funny. But you know what? That was real important back at Calvin when I see it. Why? A lot of preachers didn't get paid very much. They were about starving out there. But when you made the church in the state one, guess who's going to pay the churches now? The state. Going to make a good salary for everybody, but the only thing about it, they started elevating some above the others. I tell you what, some preachers ought not hardly get a dime for what they do. <laughs> some work and they ought to be paid a lot more than they're paid. That's truth. But that's just the way life is, isn't it? I guarantee you one thing. What you are is not have any, doesn't have anything to do with dollar signs in the Lord. You can have a jewel of a small church or a gigantic mega church. And if you're reaching souls and, and baptizing them and discipling them and you're doing it, the, the little church can do as much as the big church. Sometimes a whole lot more and a whole lot sounder. Or vice versa. Celibacy. What was wrong with celibacy? What really came out about celibacy that was so bad? Perversion. Perversion of <coughs> the human nature. In uh, pagan religions, there was celibacy. In some pagan religions. How about the monks? And the Buddhist monks and all that kind of stuff. It's all messed up, but they they their celibacy and then and the Catholicism adopted that celibacy. I am glad that the the Western Church or not the Western Church, but the Eastern Church never adopted that. That's what we call the Greek Orthodox. Well, we have a uh, Wycliffe preaching the Word of God. We have uh, Huss. We have the Inquisition started. Inquisition. What are they inquisiting? Your faith. Huh? Which faith you belong to. Yeah. What year did the Inquisition start? Uh, 1231. Nicole, what about the Inquisition? What happened in the Inquisition? They started interrogating people what you believe. Going out and if you didn't come to this church, you weren't part of the church, and you lived in this town, and you didn't come down here, your name wasn't on this church roll, we're going to find out what you believe, so we're going to inquisit you. In chapter 5, in the John T. Christian's book, he talks about some of these inquisitions. He says that the churches, some of these people were in Albi, France, for one thing. They were called Albigenses. What does Albi mean? What does Albi mean? White. White. All right, white. Genses, people. A white race. Not talking about white people with blue eyes and blonde hair. It's talking about pure people that lived a different life. Here we have the Catholic Church. It's so powerful right here. And we have people running around out there killing, stealing, and robbers and everything, but making the sign of the cross every time they get something. Every time. And we have the people that are totally separate. So they started going and, and, uh, in, and asking them, interrogating them, and asking them, what do you believe? Why don't you come down to church when we go? Well, 
we're really having a church in our home. What do you believe? What do you mean you're having a church? Who gave you the authority to have a church in your home? And if they didn't give them the answers they wanted, you know what they did with it? Well, sometimes they boiled them in oil. Sometimes they cut them up in little pieces and ate them. In the name of the Lord. You don't think I'm telling you the truth? You just look and this is these will tell you the names of the people that they did this to. Okay? You they're they're here. The very names of the people that were crucified, cut up, dismembered, and cooked and eaten. They took their hides and made saddle covers out of them. You know what they did to the American Indians over here? The soldiers? Some of the soldiers were nothing but outlaws. They did exactly the same thing to the Indians that they did to these guys. Where do you find out? Where can you get paperback books like that? Brother, I'm the only person you can get it from. It's going to cost a lot of money. <laughs> I want to order one. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll get one for you. But I, you can't get a hardback. It's in two volumes now. Uh, I can't. How much did you give for it? Close, somewhere under a hundred dollars. Sixty dollars. How much? Sixty dollars. Was it sixty? Sixty dollars for both volumes. Okay, sixty dollars. It's photocopied. That's like this thing here. This one here is Wall of History and Hanford Baptism. So you, that's thick. This one here kind of came in one volume originally. Uh, Conrad Nathan Glover brought that over here and, and had it printed, and I have that printing of it. But uh, now it just comes in two volume, and somebody else is printing it. They're not printing it at all anymore. That is not fun reading. It's no. not for the faint of heart. And no, it's not for the faint of heart. That, oh, yes. This, this gives you the names of the people that were tortured. And the descriptions. And the descriptions of the torture. Would it be somewhat similar to Fox's Book of Martyrs? Yes, yes. Somewhat like that. But that was written in the 1600s or 1500s, probably. Yeah. Now, I, I want to tell you something else. Back in during this time, we talked about what people believe. We talked about the origin, the origin of the European churches. I want to give you a little bit of that. I'm going to try to get through this. <clears throat> and this was one of the important tenets that I was going to try to cover tonight about St. Patrick. Who's St. Patrick? Christian, Anabaptist. Well, he was. But who the Catholic Church say St. Patrick is? One of their saints. You can pray to him if you want to, and he'll do this or that for you. But uh, but St. Patrick had a problem. I'm going to read you a little bit of history. Now, this is not a Baptist history. This is just who's who in church history, okay? I want you to read this to you, and just think about this fellow for a while. Patrick lived from about 389 to 461 or more. He might have existed. They don't know. He could have been born in 325 and existed to 461. Because some of them say that he was way over 100 years old when he died. But let's see what it says. The legendary hero and celebrated patron saint of the Irish. Patron saint. He was a saint, all right. He was a saint of God, but he wasn't a saint of the Catholic Church. <coughs> was, it, was uh, actually born either in Dumbarton, Scotland, or in uh, Glasgowshire, Wales, or possibly near the Severn in England, but not in Ireland. Let me tell you a little bit about the history of these Baptists. The history of these Baptists, where did they come from? How did they get there? In your New Testament, Paul talks about Pudens and Claudia. Pudens and Claudia were converts of Paul and they went into the English area. Actually, they went in Wales. And they had a son named Linus. And Linus was a preacher and they preached and Linus was a preacher. They evangelized that whole area with truth. Paul's writings and everything. This was truth back there and they established churches and uh, we go on down now for not two or three hundred more years and we come down to St. Patrick. Patrick was a uh, a child of a Baptist family in Wales, probably. Some of the very first churches established in America that came over here were from Wales that go back to these churches. Now, there was a time that 
you know, the Church of England, it was bad to be an Anabaptist, but there were a lot of Anabaptists in England still hiding out, acting different, hiding out in different areas. Okay. So what group of Baptists came from Wales to the U.S.? Well, we're going to get that when we get over here. I'm just telling you, this is where they came from. But now we're studying now, we're studying about Patrick, so I have to tell you a little bit about Patrick and how the faith got to, to Wales and England and all that. Because we're going to be studying that over here. And we have the Church of England making that essay there on the churches of the valleys of the Piedmont. How, they got, how did those people get over there, okay? Where did they come from? The Roman government tried to conquer... The Welsh people, they couldn't do it. They had ponies over there and they fought ferociously. These people were not going to give up their freedom and become subjects of the Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire finally said, well, we can't whoop you, so why don't you just join us and you can become members of the state and everything else. They couldn't whoop them, can't conquer them, so they did. But these were always an independent people. These Welshmen were. okay, But they also... Later on, they were infiltrated with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here we have an early convert from England and Wales. His name is Patrick. His father's name was Calpurnius and was a deacon in the church. His grandfather was a pastor and the family was a devout Christ, devoutly Christian. Kidnapped by Irish pirates. He's Irish or something else in history. You find out that those are scoundrels. Most of them were headhunters and, and, and cutthroats. And they were pirates out on the open sea. And they were bad. Now, they were always known to be bad people. These were, these were violent, vicious people. But now, let's see what happens to these violent, vicious people. And when he was about 16 years old, Patrick was sold as a slave in Ireland and subjected to humiliating ill treatment. Young Patrick, however, apparently remembered his Christian upbringing. He managed to escape to France by boat and finally made his way home to Britain. In response to a vision, though, and I believe this vision, according to Patrick, was a, an unction, was a conviction from God, he returned to Ireland to carry the gospel to the wild heathen, infidels, the Celtic tribes, about 457, he was an energetic worker, an expert organizer, planting over 200 congregations. Actually, he, he actually established 365 churches. Baptizing over 100,000 people himself. Patrick Hauer uh, had his critics in the Catholic Church. They didn't like it. They didn't like he was there. His confession, uh, the church in opposition among the Irish also. His confession is an attempt to clear himself of the charges that he was poorly educated and that he came to Ireland without any uh, authority from the Catholic Church and only for personal gain. That's what the Catholic Church was saying about Patrick was being persecuted by the Catholic Church. Patrick was actually turned down as a candidate for a bishop in Ireland. The Catholic Church wouldn't organize wouldn't recognize him. They didn't recognize him at all. They wanted to send somebody else over there. They tried to send somebody over there named uh, Augustine. Not Augustine in, in, uh, in Egypt, northern Egypt. What's it? Constantine. The first bishop of Ireland had already been named by the Catholic Church and they didn't want Patrick to preach at all. Patrick's vigorous personality and administration gifts, however, brought him great prestige and ultimately an appointment as a bishop. He was a pastor. He introduced the, uh, the diocese and the episcopate to Ireland. What was the diocese and the episcopate? The Catholics are trying to say that he, he founded dioceses. They tried to say that he founded monasteries. That was a bunch of baloney. He didn't believe in that. He didn't found that. What he founded was 365 churches. And he ordained pastors and deacons in every church that he established throughout. <clears throat> it says that many legends and things were spawned about him, but that uh, many people think that there were two or three Patricks in and early, early, early church history. 
They also say that his polity and his beliefs were very much akin to primitive Baptists. And Patrick, by faith and practice, was probably an early primitive Christian. What were early primitive Christians? What were they? <laughs> they were Anabaptists. So, St. Patrick was not a Catholic, but an Anabaptist, or a Baptist, or a Christian. All right, a Christian. Is that why they're still fighting today? No, they're, they're not fighting for that reason at all today. They're fighting today over Catholicism and uh, and the church, what we call the, the conflict is between the Protestants and the Catholics, isn't it? What Protestants are over there? Church of, church of England. England. What's the Catholic Church? Church Catholic Church. All right. It's polity. Uh, it's it's uh, politics. It doesn't have anything to do with faith at all. Only in that they want the cat the the the. The Irish Catholics want the Catholics to rule them, and the Irish Protestants want the Protestant Church or the Church of England to rule them. Well, Patrick was part of establishing early churches in England and all through the European because it filtrated into France. It filtrated all through here. It went into Ireland, and he kind of uh, civilized those wild Irishmen, didn't he? I tell you a story about Irish because my wife's or an Irish scene that gets her Irish up and the little horns start growing and then I have trouble. <laughs> well, are you ready to quit tonight? Is this enough? Is this it? Is this enough? We'll go back and we'll get some more of it next week and we'll go on and we'll see what John T. Christian says about it. Uh, thank you for your attention. We've gone on over an hour, about an hour and 15 minutes. But... Uh, about 20 minutes till 6 and we started actually before wait a minute we started at 4.30 didn't we yeah. 4.30 5.30 we started before 4.30 and now we are at past 5.30 well I guess it wasn't too bad and I didn't get half of it on tape about half of it I missed the best half and you know I didn't mean that I did it all for nothing because I I, I taught you guys but you know what? This goes around the world. And if you looked at those websites, you know that it goes around the world. And I and when I don't get it on tape, I feel like such a fool and I, I feel like I've wasted something because, boy, this is really must be touching people's lives because they're getting... When this goes out on the air, there's going to be 30 or 40 downloads right off the bat wherever they're going. And I don't know where it all goes, but it's going to be out there and people are going to be learning from it. And I am glad of that. That's why we're here is to teach the Word of God. You're backing me up. You're giving me somebody to teach. You are only a few here. But you're learning. Human dummies. <laughs> brother? You said the audience. Human dummies. No, you think that man's a nubby, brother? He is brilliant, isn't he? Just, his mind is like a tar buffer. It sticks, and it comes back. Brother, you are one of my it's best like students. Sponge. It goes in there and I'm going to tell you what, there's a whole lot sticking. There's a whole lot sticking in there, I guarantee you that much. You've got a young mind because it works. You're the one that has all the answers when I ask the questions. That ought to tell him something, huh? Yep, humility. That's good for a guy. Well, Brother David, would you dismiss us in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this opportunity to hear the word preached, Lord. We just ask that you, uh, that you uh, allow it to touch our hearts so that we can transfer it on to other people that, that don't know you, Lord. We just pray for them.